Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today we're going to look at more rotational dynamics problems. In this video I'm looking at two fixed axis problems. I have a disc and different types of questions associated with the dynamics and the kinematics of rotating discs. In the first one I'm applying a force pulling on a string that's going to make it speed up. We've got a whole series of questions. And on problem two it's a grindstone that is um, applying the brakes to slow something down. Alright, we're going to look at uh, torque forces, angular acceleration, angular velocity, displacement, kinetic energy. All right, let's look at all of these for these two problems. There are three ways to support Physics Ninja. Uh, number one, like the video. If it helps you out, uh, consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. And if you have the means, consider giving a super thanks. All right, let's get started. All right, here's problem one. We have a solid cinder, cylinder that has a radius R. It starts from rest and can rotate without friction about an axis through its center of mass as shown. We have a string that's wrapped around it and this force here from the tension here is 3.6 Newtons. Um, it's being pulled with a constant force, okay? Uh, the rotation axis is fixed so that the center of mass does not move as the cylinder rotates. So it's a fixed axis problem. Also, the magnitude of the angular acceleration is given. All right, let's look at the first question here. Which of the following statements is true? There is a non-zero net torque on the cylinder, but the net force on the cylinder is zero. All right, look at B. There's a both a non-zero net torque and a non-zero net force. And then C, there's a non-zero net force on the cylinder, but the net torque of the cylinder is zero. So we're here comparing the net force and the net torque, okay, um, net. So what about the net torque? So we fixed our axis right over here, and we have this force that is acting a certain distance from the pivot. So we know here we're going to have a net torque of RF. Now there might also be a uh, force acting right at the pivot point, but that one doesn't produce a, a force. So we do have a non-zero, uh, net torque, which is why it's speeding up. And we know that also because they give us an angular acceleration. And you should remember that uh, Newton's second law for rotation is this. If there is a net torque, uh, there's an angular acceleration. Now this is also a fixed axis problem, okay? And they do tell us that the center of mass of the cylinder does not move. So guess what? That means that the net force acting on it should be zero because the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. All right, so let's go see. So there's a non-zero net torque, uh, but the net force is zero. So I think the best choice that we have here is choice A. All right, how about the next one? They say, what is the mass of this cylinder? Okay, and for that, we're going to go back to our second law for rotation here. Now, uh, we calculated what the uh, net torque was. Uh, the net torque is simply RF. Now we're dealing with a disc or a cylinder, okay? The moment of inertia of a cylinder, if you treat it like a disc, you would simply say one half mr squared. So here that's the moment of inertia that I substitute here and that introduces the mass to this problem. And the alpha we know is given in the problem. So now we can simplify, we have a radius on each side that we can cancel. And my goal is to isolate for the mass. So here I have mass is equal to, bring the two on the other side, you have two f, and then I have to divide by R alpha. So then I get two, substitute the numbers, 3.6. The radius is 0 0.45 meters. And my angular acceleration here is alpha. I think if I do all that, I think I get 1.45 and that should be measured in kilograms. So our best choice here has to be choice B. All right, what about so, uh, question three here? It says, what is the angular displacement of the cylinder after the force has been pulled for eight seconds? Okay, so now <clears throat> this is a kinematics problem. So my angular displacement after some time t, here's my kinematic equation. Um, so the amount of rotation that I get depends on where I started that initial angle. The initial uh, angular frequency plus one half angular acceleration multiplied by t squared. Now we're just going to set this to zero. Um, we can also set the omega zero to zero. That's the, our, our initial angular velocity because it started from rest. Okay, that's given in that first sentence right there. 
So the only thing we have left now are these uh, last terms here. So we have one half, our angular acceleration is 11 radians per second squared. And my time was eight, and I can't forget to square that value. If you substitute everything inside, you should get 352 radians. Okay, uh, and that corresponds over there to choice E. That's my displacement. All right, how about this last one? Suppose the kinetic energy of the cylinder is eight seconds after you pull it is kt. How does the kinetic energy after if you pull it uh, twice as much time? We call it k2t compared to the original one. All right, so let's go ahead and try to compare these two. So we're going to have kt and then k of twice that amount of time. Well, the kinetic energy, we're looking at rotation here. So it's one half i omega squared. So the moment of inertia is a disk, so we simply use this value, but that doesn't change. Right? Whether I pull it uh, 8 seconds or whether I pull it uh, 16 seconds, that remains the same. What happens to the omega now? Again, we're looking at a kinematic equation right here. And this value of omega, remember, you can write it as um, some initial value plus alpha multiplied by time. But that initial value is 0, so this omega is basically just alpha t. So guess what that means? Now I can calculate what this is. It's that moment of inertia, which is the same for both cases. But the omega now looks like this. I can substitute for alpha t. All right, what happens now if I pull for twice as much time? What would this look like? I'd have one half. I would have that moment of inertia. And then I would have alpha, but here I would pull for twice the amount of time. And I have to square everything. Uh, one thing you could see is that uh, this guy right here is, once you take care of this 2 that's inside um, this square term, you're going to have a 4. And the rest of the term is basically going to be left with kt. All right, so the, kine uh, the kinetic energy, rather, is going to be 4 times bigger if you pull it twice as long. Okay, so the best choice that we have here is actually choice B right here. All right, these ones can sometimes be a little bit tricky, okay? Especially this guy, because you have to kind of combine two equations in order to see that. All right, let's go to problem two. All right, here's problem two. We have a cylindrical grindstone here of mass M18 kilograms, and the radius is 0 0.6 meters. It's initially rotating at some angular velocity, which is given by 29 pi radians per second. And here we have an axe, okay, that's brought into contact with the grindstone, which brings it to a stop after 30 revolutions. All right, we have a few questions here related to this system. What is the magnitude of the angular acceleration of the grindstone? All right, so let's think about this. Well, what do we know? We know we have an initial angular velocity, which is given by this, 29 multiplied by pi. Uh, that's in radians per second. We know it comes to a stop, so the final value has to be zero. And then we know something about the angular displacement, right? My angular displacement, they tell me, is uh, 30 revolutions. Well, let's convert revolutions to radians. So I know in one revolution, I should have 2 pi radians. Uh, so if you do that, now you can see the revolutions uh, cross out. And what you're going to be left with now, if you multiply this out, you get 2 times 30, which gives me 60. And I'll just leave the pi right there. So this is my displacement in radians. Now, this is a kinematics problem. One of the kinematic equations looks like this. Omega final squared, omega initial squared, plus 2 alpha multiplied by the angular displacement. Now, you could have also solved for the time first and then use another kinematic equation, but for now, I'm just going to use this one because they don't ask me for time. They don't ask me to solve for it. I know this is zero, so this simplifies my life. So if you want to isolate here for this angular acceleration, all we do now is minus omega squared divided by two times that angular displacement. Now we substitute our values. Just be careful when you do this. Uh, here you get 29 pi, but you have to square everything. And divided by 2 times uh, 60 multiplied by pi. All right, if you put this in the calculator again, uh, this is going to give me a negative number. That simply tells me that it slows down. But uh, if we're looking for the magnitude of the angular acceleration, um, and you do that, you should get something like 22 radians per second squared. Okay, and that there corresponds to uh, choice C.
right here. All right, the next thing they ask me is what is the magnitude of the frictional force on the axis on the grindstone? Well, let's think about what we have here. So we have this object that is spinning at some initial angular velocity, and how would it slow down? Well, it would slow down if there is a friction force here acting in this direction. I'm going to call that F for that friction force. So how would I determine this? Well, again, we're dealing with dynamics now because we're looking at forces and torques, for example. So we look at Newton's second law, which says that the net torque acting on that grindstone has to be equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Now remember for the disc or a cylinder, we simply treat it like a disc. So we use our moment of inertia through the center as one half mr squared. That you look it up in your book. So the next thing we do is, well, we want to solve for the frictional force. So how do we do that? Well, that's going to be buried in this torque, right? This frictional force is acting a certain distance away from the pivot, right? The distance over here is r. So the torque produced by that frictional force is simply the force multiplied by the distance to the pivot, which is r. And now we substitute everything else in. Our moment of inertia is 1 half mr squared and multiplied by our alpha. Our goal now is just to simplify this a little bit, get rid of one of the radius values right here. And you're left with an expression for f. So guess what? You can substitute values now. So you get 1 half. The mass was 18. The R value was 0.6 meters, and my alpha, I just obtained that, was 22. Uh, you put that in a calculator, and you should get a frictional force. Uh, I think I did that, and I got approximately 119 newtons. Okay, so that's kind of the frictional force acting on that wheel. So I think choice A is probably the best choice for this problem. All right, the next one, uh, what is the direction of the torque due to this frictional force? So for that, you have to think about the vector definition of a torque produced by a force. It's given by this cross product of R and F. And now think about the directions of each one of those. R is a vector that goes from the pivot all the way to where the force is being applied. So for us, uh, if I just write it like this, little r will be, it has a magnitude equal to the radius, and the direction is in the x direction. The x direction, I represent that with an i hat. What else? Well, the force is what? Our force for this problem here is going to be this frictional force. So what is the direction? That's the magnitude. What's the direction? The direction looks like it's in the minus y direction. So I call that the minus j hat direction. So now you substitute the vectors down here below. What do we get? We get the magnitude r um, times i cross product now of f with uh, minus j hat. So now you take all these constant terms in the front, and what are we left with? We're left with rf, the magnitude of the torque, and the direction now is given by this, i hat cross with minus j hat, okay? Well, i cross j gives me a z, or k hat direction. Um, so at the end, you bring that negative sign to the front, you get minus rf, and i cross j gives me k hat. All right, and you see the negative in the front? Negative front simply indicates that it's in the minus k hat direction. And if you look at our choices here, the minus k hat direction has to be this one here. That's the minus k hat direction, which tells me it's into the page. You could have also simply found the direction of this by using uh, something called the right hand rule, all right? You take your fingers and you place them along the first vector. So take your hand, your right hand, and place your fingers along this vector. And then you curl your fingers toward the second vector, and you should find that your thumb points into the page when you do that. Okay? Um, anyway, uh, that's it for this problem. All right, folks, that's it for me for today. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed these problems. We'll see you next time.